Hello, I'm Mike Graziano, and welcome to this series of videos on how to compose a symphony. Together, we'll continue where we left off last time, and here's the score, enticingly empty and waiting. And as usual, we'll write a sketch first, what's called a continuity sketch. I like to write the sketch in the first violins. Sometimes I stick in extra notes, and people say, whoa, violins can't play that. And yes, I know, but the extra notes are helpful. When we go back and orchestrate, we can distribute those extra notes into other instruments. The first movement was in C, and we could put all the movements in C, that would be standard, but I find that unacceptably boring. Let's do G, I like the key of G. For this movement, we've picked a short rondo form. I explained it in the last video, melody A, followed by B, with a return to A, followed by C, and a final return to A. A simple, elegant form that anyone can compose. You can do this just as well as I can. In this particular video, we'll sketch the first melody, the A section, and it will take a little while because we have to get it right. Your first job is to get the continuity sketch right. Most of the work in composing a symphony is creating the continuity sketch, and later the orchestration is the easy part. In the classical period, beauty was associated with stripping the music to its simplest elements. So let's be merciless in stripping down our tune. Let's start with the tonic triad the one chord, the foundation of the key of G major, which contains three notes, G, B, and D. And then let's move briefly to the five chord, the dominant, which contains D, F sharp, and A. In this case, just the A and the F sharp. Then we'll return to the home note, G. You can't get simpler than this little phrase. It's the simplest way to outline the essence of the key of G major. Let's listen to it. Music has a grammar. You start on the one chord, you step away from it to the five chord, creating some tension, and then you step back to the one chord, resolving the tension. Like a sentence in a child's grammar book. Classical composers loved that kind of simplicity. Part of what makes a tune like this work is a steady, underlying rhythm. So let's give it an accompaniment, just so we have an idea of how it might sound eventually. And I'll put in a few bowing marks. And dynamic marks. And there we have the start of a perfect little classical slow movement tune. Let's listen to it again and think about what should come next. How about we repeat the phrase, but shift it up in the air a little? Let's listen to that. It's still so simple, so bare bones. It's delightful. It's something you can sing. It invites anyone to sing along with it because it's so easy. That kind of democratic singing appeal is exactly what classical composers aimed for in constructing a beautiful tune. But now I think it's time to introduce a third harmony. In classical music, every key is defined by three principal points. The one harmony is the ground floor on which everything is trying to land. Harmonic gravity pulls you down to the one chord, in our case a G chord, but you can jump up in the air to the five harmony and then fall back to the one. 
you can also jump up in the air to the four harmony. And you can leap from the four to the five like a squirrel, that triangle bouncing back and forth between those vertices and eventually coming back to the ground. That's the structure. There are lots of fancy complexities, different chords you can stick in, dissonant notes, crunchy harmonies, dipping into other keys. It's all elaboration on the simple skeleton. That's why a tune like this, stripped down to the skeleton, works so well. Here's a four harmony. I actually think of it more like a two harmony. I personally think that the textbooks have this one wrong. What people call the four chord is really a two seven chord in its heart. And then we can move back to the one chord. Then back to the two chord. and then to the five chord, let's listen to how this tune is shaping up. It's a simple alternation between harmonies, and while it starts with bare bone notes, it picks up a little extra complexity as it moves along. It reminds me of the Mozart clarinet concerto, and it ends on a five, it ends on a D, so it's not done yet. We have what's sometimes called a question and answer tune, or in more fancy terms, an antecedent and consequent tune. Here we have the question, which ends on a 5. Now we need the answer, which ends on a 1 or on a G. That's easy. We just repeat what we have, but with a slightly different end. As a note to myself, I'm going to stick the flute up here. That'll remind us that we should make the repetition swell a little, make it a little more lyrical when we get to the orchestration. But now we need to change the ending, something that brings us back to rest on the G harmony. Let's try the simplest possible change here, just a few notes. Now let's listen to the whole tune. See, I don't like that. It's okay, but the ending is so square, it doesn't go beyond what was already in the first half of the melody. We need something a little more extravagant, something new in the second half, to make the whole tune feel worthwhile. This new ending took me a while to work out, and a lot of false starts, but I'm editing those out so I don't bore you. Don't be afraid to spend some time crafting your tune until it works. Normally, classical music comes in units of four measures. The four-bar phrase, one phrase after the next, after the next, it creates an expectation. And now and then you need to violate that expectation. 
There's no point having an expectation in music if you don't violate it sometime. Here I'm stretching the four-bar phrase, adding what's called an extension, a two-bar extension. So the tune is now two bars longer than it ought to be. That helps the eventual end of it feel a little more satisfying. Now let's listen to the whole tune and see how it works. Ooh, that is so classical. It's so exactly classical. The deceptively simple start, stripped down to a few notes. The gradual addition of extra complexity, the way the tune moves into new directions and extends itself at the end. That final little flourish, that classical cute fist bump at the end. This is our A melody. I think our A melody is done. We only have two more melodies to sketch and then we're done with a sketch of the whole movement. Always remember that continuity sketch is the backbone of the movement. It may seem like a lot of work to get a trivial little thread of a tune that doesn't even sound like much. But this is where you have to do most of your work and get the feel of the movement right. You can orchestrate the bejesus out of a bad sketch, but it's still bad music. If you have a good sketch, the orchestration kind of writes itself and the music will be good. So let's finish our sketch of the movement in the next video. I hope you enjoyed this one and thank you for watching.